This is New Mexico Frontiers. Presented by Ferris Research. Hello and thank you for joining us on this episode of New Mexico Frontiers, the digital series. I'm Chad Brummett. Uh, and if you're like me, you probably, you've got an iPad close by, cell phone close by, a smartwatch. Today I don't have my smartwatch on. But within all of these things, all around us, microelectronics, microprocessors that are running all of these computations, making these machines work, and they can do anything from the pedestrian of running our iPads and our tablets and smart devices, all the way to national defense, national security applications, which we will not get into. We will not unpack those, but we will be speaking to one of the big players here, at least in New Mexico, when we're talking about microelectronic semiconductors, and that is Sandia National Labs. Reno Sanchez with uh, Mesa, which I'll, we'll unpack what Mesa is here in just a second. Director here, first of all, thank you for joining us this morning to talk about this. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's just kind of establish first, when we're talking about semiconductors, microelectronics, microprocessors, what are these? We've probably heard them before, but we may not have wanted to raise our hand in class and say, what is that? Yeah, they're essentially uh, microchips that allow you to implement logic functions, whether the function is a processor to implement some kind of logical sequence of events uh, or some kind of control. It might control uh, the uh, airflow in your house mm -hmm. or the temperature, uh, microwave. Almost everything now that's electronic has microelectronics or chips inside of them. Okay. Um, now at Mesa, uh, let's, let's first unpack what Mesa stands for and the work that you guys do. Now we previously, just recently on New Mexico Frontiers, our, our TV show, uh, we unpacked a little bit of the work that Mesa is doing. Uh, but for those that have might have missed it, uh, tell us about the work going on over at your facility. Yeah, so Sandia has, has been involved with microelectronics for a number of years. Um, we focus on microelectronics for national security applications. These are microelectronics that have to work uh, no matter what, um, have to work all the time, no matter if it's radiation events, temperature, uh, different types of uh, hostile type environments. Uh, if you think about your cell phone, it works great, has a lot of computational power, but it will not work in any of these environments. So we specialize in environments uh, that are national security related. Gotcha. And the work going on there, I mean, it really is mind blowing. One thing I think that we should um, highlight uh, a lot of this work, it is done in clean rooms, um, which we directly have Sandia to think for just the, the technology of a clean room. Yes. Um, in 1959, a gentleman, a Sandia, a Sandian, we call ourselves <laughs> Sandians, uh, Willis uh, Whitfield, uh, was on a task force to look at uh, different clean rooms across the, the country, uh, you know, to build microelectronic chips. It turned out these clean rooms were not very clean. Uh, in fact, uh, the cleanest one they found during that investigation was a, a, a million particulates uh, per square foot uh, of air. So we're talking about something that's very, very dirty. Um, and so he took it upon himself, along with the team, uh, to see if they can come up with something new. In 1961, uh, Willis uh, came up with a prototype for a clean room. And he wound up uh, coming up with something that was 750 particulates per square foot wow. uh, of, of, uh, of air. So you're talking about 1 million versus 750 Holy particulates. Lord. So uh, what happened was a lot of people didn't believe they, oh, they must have made up the data, right. or that can't be possible. Well, once they proved that, yes, it was indeed possible, it caught on like wildfire, uh, oh. and everyone then adopted it. So all of the clean rooms, it's called a laminar uh, airflow, is, is kind of the official name of what he invented. And this laminar airflow is what's being used in almost, well, basically every semiconductor fab in the world, and also all the pharmaceutical fabs. So, yeah, wow. one, one man changed the world, and it was a Sandian. That's it was amazing. here in New Mexico. That re I mean, that really highlights the important work and the sort of the global changing work that continually happens at Sandia National Labs. Um, I want to talk about uh, a recent um, 
uh, joining that Sandia National Labs did with the National Semiconductor Technology Center. Um, and uh, why we decided to do that, what the, what the, the impetus was for Sandia to, to join this, this center. Yeah, on the NSTC, the National Semiconductor Technology Center, we decided to join for a number of reasons. Um, one, we've been a key player in semiconductor technology moving forward. I mentioned about Willis, you know, and he did patent that technology in 1964. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that Sandy has also done that maybe people don't know about is a lot of people when we're getting to close to, uh, in, in, in the 1990s, getting close to 2000, thought the lowest, uh, the smallest lithography, that's the, the width of a transistor, mm-hmm. Um, the smallest it could be was seven millimeters. And with the needs of today, uh, we knew we needed to go beyond that. Mm-hmm. So Intel reached out to us, and we had a, a partnership uh, looking at uh, different uh, ways to get beyond, beyond the seven nanometers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that wound up uh, creating a crater consortium I think it was called U, um, U, uh, EUV, uh, Extreme Ultraviolet okay. uh, Lithography, uh, LTCC. So it was a little uh, temporary company that was put together. Of course, Intel, Sandia National Labs, mm-hmm. and some of the other uh, main semiconductor vendors were part of that um, to figure out how we go to this uh, Extreme Ultraviolet uh, lithography so we can go beyond the seven nanometer boundary right now the smallest nanometer that's being developed uh lithography is is 1.8 really so so we were able to go beyond that there were 126 patents uh, that were generated with that ltcc and sandia uh, owns or co-owns 34 percent of all those patents so so we've we played a big role even though some of those chips um, you know, we don't use that lithography for our missions, mm-hmm. but again, it's Sandia contributing uh, to the, to the yeah. world and to those missions. And that that seems to happen a lot. Like you said, you uh, the Sandia National Labs as one of the two national labs in the state. You have certain directives and certain you know client work that you're doing for the Department of Defense and other things. Um, but a lot of that technology, as we were saying before we started rolling, people that have specific needs or specific problems, they're coming to you because they know that Sandia has this this pedigree and that's got this legacy of innovation. Um, so even though we're, we're not doing the mass run at Sandia National Labs, um, one of the great things, and this has been historically all, you know, since post, you know, World War II and post Manhattan Project, that innovation comes through and it happens and is developed here, um, that th- these innovations can take place, but then it can go and have different applications beyond national defense or it, it it can have a footprint globally that we're not even aware of it seems uh that's that's definitely true um so we we engage in a lot of those type of activities the reason specifically that we joined the nstc um was first of all to contribute um uh, you know technology mm-hmm. that can advance uh the u.s mm-hmm. In, uh, in moving forward with, with semiconductors. We, uh, the U.S. used to uh, own or produce uh, about 35% of the semiconductors in the world. Mm-hmm. And this was um, in the 1990s. Mm-hmm. Uh, today, that's 12%. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, and we produce almost none of the chips that are really advanced that when you're, you know, that are AI or that are um, AI standing for artificial intelligence, right, I'm sure right. everyone knows that, but just in case. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, your smartphone, all your advanced applications, yeah. um, you know, that really is not done here. It, it's done in, uh, primarily in, in Taiwan. Okay. And so, you know, NSTC is really about how do we bring those jobs back here. Right. And that's really what the uh, uh, bipartisan legislation, the CHIPS mm-hmm. Act, CHIPS and Science Act, mm-hmm. uh, is all about. Mm-hmm. So um, the NS, NSTC started with the CHIPS Act. And it's really a, a group of um, people, both from the labs. We were the first members, but opened the door for other labs to join. Really? Okay. And, um, 
and people from industry yeah. to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we do this? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think the need for it was evident with the pandemic. I was going to say, we, how many car dealerships you saw a yeah. shortage and it wasn't because of bumpers, it wasn't because of tires, it was because of the microprocessors that, that exactly. were going. NVIDIA, they could not keep up with, you know, the demand and you saw graphics cards yeah. skyrocket in price. Yeah, they were, I think the average car has 1,500 uh, microchips wow. inside it. An electric car has over 4,000. Really? Wow. So, yeah, if you can't get microchips, which are in everything, mm -hmm. you can't produce anything. And so your economy is now stagnant yeah. or um, in trouble. Yeah. And so it behooves us to work together to figure out how we bring uh, the technology here. So at Sandia, we bring in uh, a lot of different technologies, uh, experts in that area. We also allow... Uh, any other members, uh, NSTC members, to have access to our fabs. Really? Okay. Uh, we have a couple of fabs now. We have a silicon fab and we have a compound mm -hmm. semiconductor fab. And that's, that's not common from what I understand, right? The yeah. fact that Mesa has this is pretty unusual. You're exactly right. Yeah, having the combination of the two is really powerful and allows us to do things that others can't. Yeah. Uh, so we can have, people could have access... And then uh, also, uh, we need a workforce mm -hmm. to be able to uh, take on all these new jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, if we bring in back all these uh, manufacturing jobs, mm -hmm. you need skilled operators. Right. You know, this is, I mean, we're talking about things that you can't see unless you see them through a microscope. Yeah. And all it takes, you know, and we're talking about, you know, in the, in the case of advanced microelectronics, we're talking about billions of transistors on one part. All it takes is one of them to be messed up, and the whole chip needs yeah. to be thrown away. Yeah, and so uh, so we need a workforce, and I think it's estimated that you know if we can get to our goal by twenty thirty two, of having I think it's around twenty five percent of the world's manufacturing chip manufacturing, that will need sixty to seventy thousand new workers. Really, and so Sandia plays a role in that as well. Okay, by either training people or by offering internships. Okay, and working with universities so they can get some hands-on experience. And I know that Sandia has historically there are a lot of initiatives, a lot of internship programs, yes. uh, and we have covered some of them on our, our TV uh, counterpart of New Mexico Frontiers. Um, to that end, I know uh, recently the labs had to do a reduction in staff of about one to three percent. Right, is that going to affect the work that is happening at Mesa? And if so, how does it affect it? How do we not let that deter or sort of get us off the path of expansion of this technology? Okay, that's a great question. So the 1% to 3% will affect all, all centers across the lab. Okay. Um, some more than others. Mesa will be affected a little bit um, is not directly related to a project. It's more related to overhead. So gotcha. we'll, we'll be doing some belt tightening there. Gotcha. But again, it's um, it's a pretty small number. Okay. Now, at the at the end of the day, um, obviously there are a number of challenges. Um, you know, as we said, it, it sort of gradually went that a lot of these semiconductors going to Taiwan, going overseas for manufacturing. What is the biggest hurdle, in your opinion, to getting us back to that twenty five percent in twenty thirty two? I think it's workforce. Yeah. Um, you know, there's now a lot of companies like TSMC that are building plants in Arizona um, and other places. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of foreign companies now that are moving back to the U.S. Okay. For various reasons. Uh, some is security. Um, uh, and and uh, other is be closer to where the end market is. Yeah. So, so that is happening. Uh, and that's, really good because um, even their their foreign companies mm -hmm. they're employing US workers okay. uh, but we also want to besides beef up that I believe the um, you know the real need is also to have domestic right. suppliers um, play a role in this what's what's happened over the years is our lithography has gotten smaller and smaller mm -hmm. so um, everything's become more and more expensive. Some of this equipment, especially the ones that we invented for that ultra mm -hmm. uh, extreme ultraviolet, you know, we're talking about close to three hundred million dollars for one tool. Holy moly! And so, and that's only one tool. 
a uh, silicon fab can have you know hundreds of tools right and they all work together uh, but photolithography is kind of the key yeah and so that's probably the most expensive but uh, all the other ones aren't cheap either right so what happens is a lot of people have been forced out of the market because of the cost of entry sure or the cost of staying in business yeah and so uh, it's only just like any other market you know you get a lot of players in there eventually uh, things start to consolidate and that's where we're at right now the uh, semiconductor industry is about uh, 700 uh, billion dollars a year um, so it's it's big and by 2032 it'll be over two trillion yeah and I think 2.06 trillion is what they're they're predicting so yeah this market isn't going away you know we um, and it seems to be scaling up at a pretty quick rate not think, only is it not going away yeah it's going the opposite direction very quickly yeah, I think uh, I think the uh, predicted average is like 14.6 percent um, compounded uh, wow. average growth so per year wow so it's uh it's something that uh, our nation needs to be part of sure i don't want to get left in the dust on it yeah this is too important we uh yeah all of uh you know the need for more capability yeah more semiconductors is increasing rapidly well and as you said also with that you know is an increased workforce so people that may be wanting to get into this field there's an opportunity it, it, to get in right now, you know, as it blows up and more of these jobs are, are needed, yes. get that training, get yourself on the ground floor so that you can continue to go up as the technology continues to go up. Exactly. And, and from a Sandia standpoint, you know, one of the, the final reasons that we joined NSTC is, um, you know, we also want to make sure that what's happening uh, as far as expansion in the semiconductor world, uh, that the national security applications can also play a role in that. So we have to be abreast on, on what's going on yeah. and, and help. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. Uh, Reno, if someone wants to keep updated on everything going on at Sandia National Labs that are cleared, <laughs> that we can know what's going on, right. um, what is the best way for us to, to, to follow you guys and to just keep up to date? I think the, the best way is probably through our, uh, our website. Okay. Uh, but uh, that'd be the best way. Okay. Uh, what we do is we release things that are, uh, unlimited release, or we call mm -hmm. it UUR. So, yeah, we won't release anything that's classified. Sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> so don't don't go there looking for secrets, but we can certainly keep up to date on all the things that are going on, and it is quite a bit. Yeah, we have a lot of really top notch people here. Yeah. That's at in Sandia and in New Mexico, and of yeah. course Los Alamos. You know, same thing there. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of highly talented people uh, across our state, and. Um, you know, it's all of us working together to yeah. create a better future. Well, that sounds great, Reno. We appreciate your time. I know that you're very busy, so appreciate you kind of breaking this stuff down and uh, keep up the great work. It's going to be exciting to see where Sandia scales up as this technology continues to scale up. So thank you for your time. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. And uh, uh, yeah, Sandia is a great place to work. That's <laughs> there you go. Well, folks, if you want more information on all the things that Sandia has going on with microelectronics, semiconductors, this recent partnership and more, we will have links at our website. Of course, that's at krqe.com. Be sure that you also download the all new Kirky Now app on your streaming devices to catch full episodes of New Mexico Frontiers, the digital series and other original programming. Until next time, I'm Chad Brummett. This has been New Mexico Frontiers, the digital series.